so thank you so much for taking time out to, to chat all things the leech the film deals with some some unwanted house guests were you drawing from from any personal experience because i think we've all had that person that won't leave whether it be a stay over or a house party or something there's always that one person that just won't go yeah, I think it's a situation that, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, for a couple of days or for a couple of months, everyone has been in. And certainly it's a situation that can escalate beyond one's control, which is very ripe for narrative possibilities. And also, you know, sort of at the time watching a lot of films like uh, Bad Influence or Unlawful Entry, a lot of these thrillers from the 90s and sort of going down that rabbit hole and exploring uh, the reality of squatters' rights and sort of some of the, the 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 legal power that people who are in your house for a period of time do have if they're there long enough. Um, so what sort of started off as a bit of research into the legality of a situation like that soon turned into, well, what if the homeowner didn't want the guest to leave? You know, what if and what would draw someone to keep someone around for that long? And that sort of logically led itself to a priest and not only a priest but a catholic priest who already lives a solitary life and doesn't have a family of his own yeah and in the leech you reunite with your statistic intentions cast you know the the now gardeners um what was it about those two that made you want to work with them again and particularly on this project well jeremy and taylor they're always sort of in my mind with almost anything i've thought of and i think with this i wanted to give them something that was definitely more unhinged, far more manic and crazy. You know, sadistic intention sort of becomes crazy at a certain point, but I, I wanted these two to sort of just be uh, a powder keg of drama and emotion and all the things that make, you know, American reality TV click, you know, characters that you would almost find on the Jerry Springer show, uh, which I had grown up sort of being fascinated by as a kid and just letting them have their way with someone that is the total opposite of them, which immediately felt like Graham Skipper in this role, but someone that he would also have to tolerate. Yeah. And what was it about Graham that made you realize that he could play this role? Because he's, I mean, he's a regular at Fright Fest, he's in many films, and he, he's sort of, I think every year he comes back with something different. So what was it about this role that made you know that he was, he was right for it? Because it is kind of different to what the Fright Fest guys might have seen him do before. Yeah, I've, I've seen Graham in all the same films that the Fright Fest crowd is used to seeing him in. And I, I just felt like he has a side to him that I've not seen, that I really felt that he could bring a lot to this character. I've wanted to work with Graham for a while. I've, I've known him and been friends with him for a bit. And, you know, he has a very interesting background as an actor, much more classically trained, a stronger theater background than, say, Jeremy and Taylor, who are more self-taught and just sort of learn on screen and not on stage. So I was interested in sort of seeing those two different acting styles come together and sort of, uh, you know, mesh on the set as much as their characters are meshing in the story. Um, you know, then unrelated to all of that, but also sort of plays into it is Graham, strangely enough, looks almost exactly like a priest that I had as a teacher in high school. Um, I have 16 years of Catholic education under my belt, which, you know, may lead to uh, a, a bit of the story going the way that it does but he, he he aesthetically looked so much like a priest that i remember having that fit the age and sort of fit the uh the the demographic that would work for the story um and you know also we made this movie during covid so there was a lot to consider there where we'd be getting people together that you know, you know we all wanted to feel comfortable around each other fortunately i'm no stranger to making small movies with minimal locations already. I think Jeremy Gardner and I had joked that, you know, when COVID happened, we were like, well, everyone's talking about making these small movies with no money and a few locations. I guess they're gonna have to take a lesson from us because we've been doing that since uh, before COVID. So that was, that, was no, that was no new thing to us, kind of making a small movie. And I think all of us getting together during that time was just sort of this powder keg of creativity that we'd all been holding back for so long. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think the the indie, especially the indie genre market, really has sort of been for years working within that single location sort of environment and things for so budgetary things. So I guess that's why, you know, horror particularly has done so well during the pandemic, because I guess the people behind the camera are used to working in this way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, you know, we're talking about filming in the in the pandemic. Obviously, you have like your sort of you know, your one location. You've got your you've got your um, sort of very very small cast. I think you filmed quite was it quite early on in the pandemic sort of days. I was wondering what yeah. the experience was like. I think like stuff had only sort of just slightly started opening up for, for for filming and that. So what was it like, sort of like hunkering down because you're making a film about a, you know like say a powder keg in a house, and I'm guessing it wasn't too dissimilar when you were filming it. That's very true. Uh, you know, the, everything came together very fast. I wrote the script in August of 2020. I sort of let everyone know the cast and crew that we were that I was writing this and I wanted them to do it, and we were filming in. January of 2021. So we're still pre-vaccine, which was very, very peculiar and very nerve wracking to work through. And I think once we all got there and sort of quarantined away into that house, we felt a lot better about it. You know, we shot three, five day weeks. So on the weekends, we're not going out to the bar. We're not going out to dinner. We're not doing anything. It didn't help that we already had a snowstorm happening as well. So we would pretty much just stayed inside we watched movies like Tammy and the T-Rex and just drank beers and I it was it really it's just such a strange a strange situation to look back on because you know the world was struggling for so many reasons and things were so uncertain but it felt like once we got into that house and locked ourselves away it was just it was just magical you know and I guess it helps then when you have your couple in the film an actual real life couple as well especially you know you say pre-vaccine you don't have to to worry about people getting close to one another because you know they already are sort of a, their own bubble yeah exactly they, they sort of you know them coming them coming from florida as their own bubble i, I mean with that said it, looking back on it it still is nerve-wracking to think about because you know we had people come Graham came from Texas. They came from Florida. We had uh, Rigo and some crew came from New York. Uh, it's you know we were we were bringing people in from a couple different corners of the continental U.S. Yeah, well, I mean it's all obviously it all it all worked out fine. And Fright Fest is called. It was sort of known amongst the regulars as, as Horror Christmas, and this film is set. You know, at, at Christmas, you know, what was it about this time period that you felt lent itself so nicely to this sort of story? I think the Christmas element of the story came about once I made that turn that I was talking about from a, a legal thriller or something that would take place more in the realm of the, the sort of the 90s unwanted house guest realm. It, it, the, lo the location changed. I realized the time of year we would be shooting at. And then all of a sudden, this notion of well, who, what kind of character would want someone as deranged as Terry and Lexi to stay in their house? Well, a priest or someone that wants to reform them. And now we're talking about, you know, the season of giving, the spirit of giving that kind of naturally puts you into Christmas, which was already the time of year we were going to be shooting this. So it kind of came about pretty naturally. And then, you know, once the first inkling of a Christmas movie becomes a possibility, then my you know, then my brain's just exploding and there's no going back. And I'm just thinking about the Christmas lights and the C9s and the trees and, you know, incorporating all, all, all of the aesthetic elements that go into Christmas movies and Christmas horror movies, which, you know, it's just, there's endless opportunities. I mean, it's, uh, you can, there, uh, there's no, there's no shortage of Christmas lights you can put in the frame. <laughs> and the film's already been snapped up by, um, by Arrow. How, uh, how's that feel? It feels great. I, their Arrow were one of the first people that I sent this film to when it was, even before it was finished, I, I can't remember quite in the process when I sent it to them, but it, it was before it was completely done. They heard it with temp music, they saw it with the color not completed and, you know, they really took to it and I really couldn't be happier with the, the turnout. Yes. And you're about to, you know, you're about to get on a plane, come over for Fright Fest. Other than sharing the leech with, with everybody, what are you most excited about the experience at the festival? Gosh, I am excited to see Scare Package 2, which Graham Skipper is also in. I got my ticket to that. Uh, I have a ticket to, I want to see Candyland. Candyland looks awesome right up my alley. Um, a Wounded Fawn. What else do I have? We're going to be, Graham and I and myself, we're going to be on the Aero Video Podcast, the live bit, which happens right before our screening. Uh, there's a couple other tickets I have as well, a couple short film blocks. Will you be making it to the karaoke party this year? Absolutely. And I'm still uh, manically trying to figure out what to sing. So you're not going to do a reprieve of break stuff? Uh, no, I, if I can't find anything, I, I, I was trying to 
remind myself that it's a book you have to flip through. It's not just like telling the DJ any song. So I can't do, I can't do the Scatman song probably. No, I mean, obviously like, I don't know if you've seen the, the um, Woodstock 99 documentary on uh, Netflix, but you know, Break Stuff's got a, a whole different sort of like <laughs> way of looking at it now. So I'm not sure if the Phoenix would be too comfortable with you singing that. <laughs> well, they might have to. Uh, they might have to break them, brace themselves if I can't find anything else. Nice. And why should obviously the the Fright Fest audience is still making their selections? Why should they take a chance on the leech? Well, I hope people take a shot on the leech because it's the perfect anti-seasonal holiday thriller that's going to scratch all of the uh, Fright Fest itches that maybe people have uh, in wanting to see. Graham Skipper and Jeremy Gardner go toe to toe in a way that they've never seen before. Cool. And have you have you started working on anything else? I've not started on anything else in a very direct sense. I'm always writing things here and there, but yeah, I got to figure that out next. I'm still wrapping up a couple of things on this one, but uh, getting closer to that uh, pocket of time where I can kind of disappear into make believe world again and start picking up early and getting to it. Cool. Well, I wish you the best of luck at the festival and with the film. Thank you, Kat. Excited to see you there.